Hey everybody, uh, my name's Austin Scott. I'm going to kick this off here. Um, I'm talking about purple teaming in ICS networks. So on the agenda today, uh, we're going to be talking about some of the basic definitions, sort of set the stage so that we're all on the same page as far as uh, uh, defining what the different assessments are and the, the different categories. Um, people have different ideas of, uh, of what they are, so I'll, I'll share mine. Uh, then we'll get into some of the ICS specific challenges that we face doing assessments in uh, these sensitive environments. And then we'll get into story time. I'll share a couple uh, stories from uh, the field where the uh, names of the uh, companies have been removed for their protection, but uh, you know, talk about some of my personal experience in uh, these networks. So first, a little bit about me. I work for a company called Dragos, uh, and we are a software uh, platform company. We have a product called the Dragos Platform uh, that provides uh, uh, passive monitoring and visibility into ICS networks. Our product's secret sauce is its threat-based analytics, which are uh, curated um, by our Intel team and our uh, Worldview reports. So it's very, uh, our, our, our analytics are very focused on the actual threats that we see and that uh, have been recorded and reported in the field. Uh, the other part of our secret sauce are the uh, playbooks. So when an alert comes in or a threat is detected, what do you do next? So part of my job is writing a lot of the playbooks uh, that provide details to the uh, operator of the Dragos platform um, about what steps to take to triage, what the different technologies are that uh, they may find. Uh, like, you know, what's, what's DMP3? Uh, uh, you know, What's a new uh, master station? You know things like that. As you as these alerts come up, there's a lot of rich detail, uh, ICS specific detail that we embed into those playbooks, so uh, people will know what to do next. Um, and I've been working in the industry for uh, 16 years now. I started my career doing software development, actually building products for uh, Schneider Electric, uh, building SCADA products uh, on their uh, software team, and then migrated into. Uh, more integration. I used to do some PLC programming and that kind of stuff in the field. And then uh, I migrated into cybersecurity for industrial control systems and uh, I've never really looked back. So I've got a lot of experience in the field, not only doing cybersecurity assessments, but actually doing uh, system integration and, uh, and wonderful things like that. So let's jump right into the definitions here. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with these terms, but uh, just so we're all on the same page. Um, cybersecurity assessments are typically categorized into uh, shades of boxes. Uh, of course, the white box is uh, all the data being shared during the assessment or upfront. Black box being none of the data being shared, so it's a uh, black box, you can't see into it. And then uh, a gray box is somewhere in between white and, uh, and black. Uh, so uh, we find that uh, gray box testing simulates uh, an activity group that has access to an environment for an extended amount of time. And this is uh, typically um, referenced as an activity group's dwell time. You know, we see in this industry that uh, when an activity group gets in, they hang out for a while and, and collect a lot of uh, pertinent information to the environment before they uh, mature enough to do ICS attacks. So um, gray box uh, um, testing is, is more what we lean towards when we only have a one week assessment. We don't have months to collect all that information. And uh, jumping into uh, ICS assessment types. So these are common terms, but uh, I want to introduce them here uh, and talk about sort of how they are different from their IT assessment type cousins. Um, an ICS vulnerability assessment is uh, more of a passive review of uh, documentation uh, and sampling of, of data opportunistically uh, to um, provide uh, an overall view of the cyber risk of an environment. And uh, an ICS penetration test is more of a white box or gray box active assessment where uh, um, we're testing for vulnerabilities and actually trying to exploit those vulnerabilities to prove that the risk exists in the environment. And finally, a red team assessment is typically a more of a black box adversary simulation um, where we are uh, uh, going in without uh, uh, 
giving the IT SOC or the uh, ICS security team a heads up and detecting uh, or testing their detection and uh, the effectiveness of their uh, uh, security controls. And finally, Purple Team is sort of a combination of Red Team and Blue Team. Um, so uh, a Red Team uh, on the offensive side, Blue Team on the defensive side. It's, it's a more of a collaborative approach to assessments where they're working together towards a common goal of reducing cyber risk. And uh, what's particularly unique about ICS uh, Purple Teams is the uh, Blue Team is usually comprised of not only cybersecurity folks, but uh, also the engineering team, site operations team, and uh, other personnel uh, who are actively using the ICS environment and uh, are familiar with it. So let's talk a little bit about the role of the blue team in the uh, ICS purple team uh, engagement. So the blue team will provide pertinent information to the red team um, to help them progress through the network more quickly. And this is kind of to simulate that, that dwell time that an activity group would typically have in an environment. And, you know, we only have a week to do this assessment, so having six months to collect all that information organically just isn't an option. So having the blue team provide hints and information and diagrams and IP addresses and even credentials at times will help us to maneuver through the network more quickly and uh, have an opportunity to uh, really test their uh, defense mechanisms and detection mechanisms. And uh, the red team's role is to communicate as they're enumerating, as they're attacking, as they're doing network pivots and privilege escalation. And uh, most importantly, to assist the blue team in troubleshooting their detection capabilities and their, um, uh, their, uh, and coming up with recommendations for improving their detection and logging capabilities in real time. So that's where we really see a lot of that value is that opportunity to really uh, be that adversary and tune those settings as, as they go. So let's jump into um, some of the ICS uh, assessment specific challenges. Now, uh, there's some differences between an ICS assessment and its IT cousin. Um, one of the most important ones is the, the difference in safety and reliability. Safety and reliability is paramount in these ICS environments. Uh, and quite often there's a strong safety culture in these environments that we need to adhere to uh, and be aligned with. Um, and any behavior that deviates from that could get uh, a contractor banned or barred from that site permanently. So we have to really be um, be aware of that safety culture and uh, watch out for even uh, small infractions or major infractions. Things that can get a contractor kicked out are, are um, uh, improper PPE, not having the right gear for the environment you're working in, going into unauthorized areas or unrestricted areas, uh, speeding in the parking lot, not holding handrails, um, going um, into areas with uh, equipment uh, that are class one, div one, that have a, you know traces of explosive gases. Uh, if you bring your cell phone in there, that could cause a real risk to the plant. Uh, uh, so that, that's some of the safety issues that we are concerned about. And uh, also touching anything, like basically touching anything in the ICS environment without permission uh, from the operators or the operations team is a big no-no, you know, whether it's an oil and gas environment or a food and bev, you know, you can't touch anything without permission. Uh, and doing so could get you barred from the site pretty quickly. Uh, and uh, on the reliability side, the site operation team and engineering teams are very sensitive to the reliability of the system. So um, putting the ICS system into any unknown state or an unrecoverable state can be uh, dangerous to the people on the site can be very damaging to the equipment and cause uh, costly outages and downtime. Sometimes an hour of downtime can be measured in, in millions of dollars. Uh, so it's, it's something that the site personnel are very sensitive to. And quite often people's uh, pay, their bonuses uh, for the year are tied to things like safety performance and reliability performance. So if you put that in jeopardy, uh, you're not gonna be very popular at the site. Um, so Really, performing any action that even has a remote possibility of tripping the process is uh, out of the question. Uh, so most sites 
um, often don't allow us to act, uh, add any packets to the network. Any kind of active uh, information gathering is, uh, is out of bounds for us quite often, um, especially in the level one, level two areas of the Purdue network, the lower areas where the controllers and the uh, PLCs and SCADA equipment is. Uh, so we have to use more um, passive methods of collecting data that don't introduce any risk into the environment. So pulling the data manually from these environments and uh, uh, doing data collection, PCAP collection from span ports, things like that that's very passive that won't introduce any risk to that environment. And even, even if you do, even if you're quite confident that uh, you're not going to cause an outage or your scanning won't create an issue, if the site has any issues, any kind of outages or problems while you're there and you're putting packets on the network, they're definitely going to blame you. You're going to take the, take the fall, so you've got to be really careful about uh, putting anything on that network. So why would we test ICS networks? Why even bother if it's so dangerous? Well, it's important to do the testing because activity groups are targeting these environments. They're actively targeting these environments. We see it. We've got the uh, intel to back that up. So it makes sense for us to actively uh, assess these and, and see what those adversary uh, activity groups would uh, potentially run into if they did try to breach these networks. So um, it does require some careful planning and experience working in these environments. Uh, uh, we do need to be under uh, with uh, constantly communicating with the uh, operations folks to uh, be successful. And often we have to find creative ways of avoiding putting packets on the network, like setting up lab equipment or testing in a training environment or a virtualization, or even testing during an outage when the site is uh, not running. Um, so the next point on specialized equipment, uh, each ICS environment is unique. You know, it's engineered, built to solve a particular problem. And the technologies you'll find at one site won't necessarily be the technologies you'll find at another. Uh, so there's a, a lot of a very specific engineering tools and protocols and wireless and OT technologies that uh, are unique to ICS that you won't find in IT environments at all. So understanding those, having experience with those is, uh, is very important to your success. Uh, quite often, uh, almost always, we'll do uh, what we call a crown jewel assessment uh, during our assessments where we identify the critical assets that uh, can really impact the business, can put people's lives at risk, uh, and um, uh, we can focus our engagement on protecting those or trying to uh, reach those crown jewel assets. Uh, so an example of that, uh, in an oil and gas site, you know, if you find a critical vulnerability in some disposal well, and they've got 30 disposal wells at the site, no one's really going to care. But if you find a critical vulnerability in their, um, in their custody transfer meter, that's like the cast register of that oil and gas site, they're going to be a lot more concerned about someone interfering with that piece of equipment. And uh, communication is also critical. Operators will want to know exactly what you're doing at any given time. Quite often you'll be doing this assessment with an operator over either shoulder, breathing down your neck as you're, as you're uh, doing the assessment. It's a bit unnerving. Um, and uh, before you do anything to the network or, or you want to try anything or touch anything, you always have to ask permission and have that constant communication uh, and that transparency with those operators so they're comfortable with what you're doing and uh, they can make sure if there's any risk that the process is in a, a safe state and uh, that interruption isn't going to cause any kind of catastrophic failure. And finally, the last sort of challenge is the cultural challenges that we, uh, we face. Um, uh, there's been for a long time a bit of uh, friction between the engineering teams and the IT teams. Quite often in the past these IT teams would come in with their security patches, their windows patches, and they'd roll those puppies out and things would go down. So there's a bit of distrust. Uh, between these different groups, so trying to bridge that that, that cultural challenge uh, can be an issue. Um, but as I said, uh, whenever you're at site trying to work in this operational environment, it can be uh, quite a challenge with operators standing over either shoulder. Um, you can uh, I always find that you can get like half as much work done when you're on site as you would normally, just because of people asking you questions and interrupting and and wanting to know what's going on. So. If you think you're going to get so much stuff done, you know, basically cut that in half because uh, it just everything takes longer when you're on site. So let's jump into a tale of two uh, ICS assessments. We're going to talk about two uh, particular engagements that we were working on um, and uh, two different approaches that were taken. One was a pure red team 
assessment. It was an energy company that was very capable, had a 24-7 SOC and uh, endpoint protection, ICS monitoring. Um, and the objective was to pivot into any ICS uh, environment, any ICS component. And there were dozens of them. Um, and the other one uh, was a purple teaming assessment, which was an energy company. Uh, and they had just completed a multi-million dollar cybersecurity program. And the objective was for us to pivot into a particular uh, control network. So during the uh, red team assessment, our initial foothold was the corporate network. Uh, and our goal was to breach into the ICS network. Uh, so we did some initial, um, initial enumeration and found an open file share on the corporate network and found some credentials, like the good old Excel spreadsheet that has the credentials to the ICS passwords and all that stuff. And we found uh, there was a, a dual-homed historian server that was doing like data replication between the ICS environment of one of their plants and the uh, uh, corporate environment of one of their plants through this SSH tunnel. So we were able to gain access to that uh, Windows machine and find the SSH credentials that it was using to replicate data with a, a file copy between the ICS network and the IT network to share that valuable data with the corporate uh, folks. And we were able to create a uh, remote desktop tunnel through that SSH uh, credential that we had into the OT environment. That was the only port that was open was the uh, SSH port 22. So we were able to pivot through that with our uh, uh, do remote desktop. We did a remote desktop uh, into that environment, found that they were reusing some really weak credentials, like the same admin, password, and user were everywhere once we were inside that ICS environment. Uh, There's credential reuse galore. So from there, we were able to do a remote desktop and a remote desktop and a remote desktop to uh, get to different uh, SCADA endpoints and take pictures of the uh, actual process running and the operator workstations and things like that. And uh, you know, we kept expecting the SOC to give us a call or, or uh, detect these things, but they never did. There was no detection, there was no um, logging, um, nothing was flagged by the uh, ICS uh, or the 24-7 uh, uh, SOC. They didn't see it at all. Um, so uh, we wrote up our findings and uh, provided that to the customer. And uh, because they weren't, they weren't really overly engaged in the process, um, even um, a couple years later, we heard about another assessment that went through, and they still had the same bindings. It was still the same kind of position it was in um, the, when we did the assessment. So um, I think the lesson learned here is, is uh, you know, having that active engagement, working with the blue team at a, at a more integrated level, uh, having that purple team approach probably would have created a different outcome in this environment. People would have been more engaged. That communication would have happened. People would have understood the risk more at different levels in the organization. Uh, and maybe that issue would have been solved and uh, remediated down the line. So let's jump into the purple team assessment that we did. Uh, so this was a bit of a different scenario. We were actually physically at the plant. Uh, and they, we had no access. They said, you know, just get, get in any way you can uh, into the plant environment and uh, see if you can get into the inner workings of the plant, the balance of plant environment. Because uh, there's, you know, in the Purdue model, there were multiple layers that we needed to pivot through. Uh, so we started off, our initial foothold was a mouse jack, uh, which is uh, the wireless Logitech mice and uh, Dell mice. Uh, they can act as keyboards and you can inject um, keystrokes into them. So we're able to get a reverse shell through uh, a mouse jacking vector right through the uh, plant manager. He happened to be using a Logitech wireless mouse and we're able to get a, a nice uh, shell back from his machine. So from his uh, machine, we were able to enumerate the plant's Active Directory environment and found that uh, they had some misconfigurations with their um, LAPS, uh, which is the um, local administrator password uh, service solution. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, uh, that uh, it's a way of reducing the risk of um, past the hash attacks and changing the local administrator password on all the uh, Windows endpoints that Microsoft rolled out. But if you don't provision those passwords, it's a central repository of those passwords that are that's stored in AD, and they didn't provision the um, some of the passwords properly, so anyone could just reach in if they knew where to grab them and, and pull them out of laps. And we found some juicy passwords in there. One was a backup service that was running a Cronus across their entire network. Uh, and it gave us basically admin access to um, the corporate side of their plant, which allowed us to uh, 
find this hypervisor server. Uh, they had um, replicated Active Directory environments at each of their different plants. Uh, and uh, they had this running in a Windows hypervisor environment. So when we added min access into that hypervisor environment, uh, we were able to um, find the virtual machine uh, that had the uh, that was running the Active Directory and export that VM and then just grab the uh, uh, the dump of all the password hashes from that uh, AD environment. Um, and then we were able to pivot into the DMZ where the, uh, the one um, jumping point, they had it really locked down in this environment, there was only one port open that went from the, uh, their DMZ into the balance of plant. Uh, and it was a tunnel, uh, a tunnel using this uh, OPC uh, software. And uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't progress any further. It wasn't regular OPC, it was like a tunneled, encrypted OPC that uh, we, uh, we couldn't uh, breach. So um, we did have success up to that point. We proved that they had locked down their environment. Um, but we did find a lot of things along the way and actively were engaging with their uh, blue team. We had the SOC uh, up on a bridge the whole time. We were talking with their, uh, their team. And as we'd run different attacks or run different enumerations, uh, they'd be like, OK, do that again. We're going to tweak this rule a little bit and see if we can detect it this time. And we tried again. And then they'd, um, they'd try to detect it. And so we were, we were helping them to hone their rules for detection and their logging, their event logging and Windows logging while the assessment was ongoing. So they were getting that value as uh, things were going on. And um, uh, we were able to. Um, help them uh, reduce that risk while the engagement was underway. So in summary, the, the Purple Team Advantage, it really does reduce the risk in uh, these engagements. You're constantly in communication with those operation folks. They're with you in the room quite often. You've got an open bridge. You're talking to the operators. Uh, so that, that communication and that um, that uh, open channel really helps you to communicate what you're doing and reduce the risk uh, to the operating asset. Uh, and it does help improve their defenses. They can test and tweak their detections in real time, and we can replay or even do a packet capture for them to work on later uh, of our attacks and our uh, enumeration methods. We can even use a lot of the tools that we see the adversary groups using, like uh, Puppy and uh, uh, compiled Python and uh, uh, different uh, memory, uh, Mimi Cats, uh, custom compiles and things like that that a lot of adversary groups are actively using so we can test their metal against what we're really seeing in the field. Um, and then uh, we're, we're building better relationships. We're leveraging that OT and IT team knowledge uh, and building that bridge between these two groups that don't always get along. So having that opportunity to um, uh, work together and also take advantage of that knowledge. These people work in the plant every day. They understand their system extremely well. So in a week's time, we can do um, what would take an adversary group or uh, uh, activity group months of, uh, of reconnaissance to pull off. And we do um, reduce risk. Uh, we're addressing the, the four different uh, the four different ICS-specific challenges that I talked about earlier. It does help reduce the uh, safety and, and uh, I mean, it does address the safety and reliability issues that we often encounter. We have that ongoing communication uh, that's important and uh, we have the knowledge of the operators and the engineers specialized knowledge of the uh, industrial equipment. Like I've worked with a lot of different environments, a lot of different PLCs and SCADA systems, but I'm always finding new ones. There's everything uh, out there uh, is uh, often uh, different and unique. And then helping build that cultural trust between these two groups. And that's, uh, that's the end of my presentation. Any questions? Yes, sir. Hi. I one of your earlier slides, you were, when you're talking about your assessments, your reference standards. So outside of NERC SIM or some of the other utility stuff, when you're, when you're not utilities, what standards are you assessing against? So uh, quite often we'll assess against their, if they have a, a corporate or ICS standard that they've stood up, uh, that they're adhering their environment to. It's not really fair to uh, compare an industrial environment to a standard that the industrial environment has no idea of. You know, it's really up to the company. If they're not in regulation with NERC SIP or something like that, they don't have those expectations, um, then uh, 
it's not fair to say, well, you should comply with this standard or that standard. We'll do whatever the customer wants. If uh, Typically, we'll use the um, NIST 882 or even 853 um, or ISA, uh, IEC 62443, things like that, uh, depending on uh, what the customer is interesting, uh, interested in aligning with. Um, but uh, it's it's almost unfair if the site isn't aware of that, if they haven't had that expectation to uh, align with these these standards, and a lot of them haven't. But there's a bunch of different standards out there, so it's it's up to the customer. We'll work with whatever. We've got people on our team who are you know on the steering committees of these standards, so they know them very well. So we can always fall back on that and and leverage that knowledge as as required in these assessments. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, in your, your talk, you mentioned about the review model. Yes. I'm wondering about the prevalence of the use of the review model. It seems like both of your uh, examples, neither of them is actually isolating the OT and the enterprise network that's suggested. What's the prevalence of the use of the review model? That, that's a very good question, and uh, it was a, a point of debate at S4 this year. In my opinion, Maybe it's unpopular, I don't know. The Purdue model is not a cybersecurity model. Uh, it's just an architecture model. Uh, so you shouldn't try to build your site to it. Every site's different and unique, has different challenges, so you should try to address the cyber risk in your environment and not try to conform with necessarily the Purdue model. Um, but it, it, it's a, I mean, it makes sense if, if your site kind of aligns with that, but a lot of them are not, don't quite fit into that, into that weird little niche. Great question, though, thank you. Yes, sir. That's a that's a really great question. I actually had a, another presentation at the end of Black Hat with Elasticsearch on that topic, uh, talking about how we use batch files and bash files to dump a lot of that information from Linux, Windows, endpoints, and then we uh, ingest that into Elasticsearch so we can do dashboarding and reporting against that endpoint. Because we'll, we will opportunistically use Rapid7 and Nessus and Nmap, but it's not always an option. So if we have to physically plug in and pull data, that's what we'll do. We'll run some batch scripts, pull that data down in text files, We've got a Python parser to, to cut it all up and throw it into Elastic to do the magic. Okay, um, I'm all out of time, so, but thank you everyone for attending. Great to see so many familiar faces.